the mighty and resilient Merrimack River, carving through the communities of our great region. My name is Linda Lorden, proud president of Merrimack County Savings Bank. And like the river that serves as our namesake, we're a constant yet ever-changing presence. Because to us, it's bigger than banking. It's about powering communities and putting people first. It's about knowing where you came from and where you're going. That's Merrimack style. Visit us at themerrimack.com. Hi, everyone. I am Sarah Edmondson, and I'm here with... Hi, I'm Anthony Ames, Sarah's husband, a.k.a. Nippy. And we're here to talk about things that are... A little bit culty. Speaking of, we were in a cult, and we woke up. Thank goodness. And we have a lot to say. And a lot to ask. This podcast is going to be a deep dive into everything from the red flags to the narcissism, the manipulation, the resiliency, the recovery process, and everything in between. Also, we want to share some of the good we got out of it so you can get all the nuggets without having to join a cult. If you haven't already, because there are a lot of things out there that are just a little bit culty. Welcome to A Little Bit Culty, a podcast about the fads, beliefs, and trends that blur the line between healthy and a little bit culty. Please subscribe so you don't miss an episode. And find us on Instagram if you have any suggestions for things you have found to be a little bit culty. Under the surface, the water fills my lungs. This ground I worship has swallowed up. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to our next episode of A Little, little bit, bit Culty. Come on, babe. Get into it. You, you go culty. Get into it. A little, little bit culty. I'm, I'm a little, okay, a little, little more chiller culty. than you. And you're and you're for the demographic that likes the My little pony. perky. I'm the for the demographic that it's a little bit chill. Okay. I think that's well, good. It's a good combo. How are you doing today, my sweet, doing? sweet husband? Let's see. I had to drop Troy off, hustle back here, get Ace out of the house. Um, we just sent him off on his own. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we sent him down the hallway. He'll He's be, two. He'll figure it out. He'll be there. We'll find him. And I'm excited to do this. I like working on this. Awesome. How are you? I'm pretty good. I just finished recording the Take Back Your Life for Yanya Lalich, who is going to be a guest down the road I'm very excited about. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, it took almost 40 hours. It's a huge book. Super epic. And I, when I was finished, I was just completely drained in the best possible way because to read a book out loud, you have to really read it. And well, obviously you have to read it, but you have to like really understand everything that you're saying. And if you don't, you've got to read it again. And so I, I had to read things that normally I'd probably skim over because they were a bit traumatic about different types of cults and family cults and all the different types of narcissists and how, how therapists need to help survivors of cults with such things and how to, how to deal with PTSD. And I realized in the process that I haven't really dealt with some stuff, which is good because that's why we're doing this to, to keep educating ourselves and to heal, but also was a bit like, Oh, I, I thought I was further along than I am in my post cult journey. But this is part of our healing, right? I, I do think so. And I think that like, you know, Nippy and I did wake up very quick. We were disenfranchised, but I was still in. I wasn't. I th I thought I was going to be a Nexium member for the rest of my life in some capacity. When this all happened, it wasn't just that we woke up. What we had a, the awareness that Keith is not who he says he is, and then as soon as you have that assumption pulled out from under you, everything else changes. And that is when we were like, "Oh my God, we're in a cult, and we have to get out." And that's actually when we re reconnected with Bonnie, who'd left, and she gave us a whole list of people and resources. And on that list was some shows and books. And one of the shows was Going Clear and also Scientology and, and the Aftermath with Leah Remini and Mike Rinder. And well, I mean, I just read and absorbed all that I could. And I remember seeing Leah being so outspoken about Scientology, a behemoth of what is said to be a cult. And I thought, you know, if she can do this, so can I. She is an incredibly successful, she was an advocate for the church for many years. She got involved when she was quite, quite young. So it was, it was like her whole childhood and, and, and upbringing. And then she had her own moment of awakening and got out and not, didn't just leave, which she totally could have, but has been 
very outspoken in trying to expose the abuses that have, have occurred there over the years. And I mentioned this on, on her podcast because I got to be interviewed by her and Mike a couple of weeks ago. And I told her that the template that her and Mike set for us was so important. That inspiration of what was possible. Like, I don't even know if we would have been so public had I not seen them do that. Do you think? No, they, no, they certainly have a lot of the same problems that we did or facing the same force that we did. And they're an amazing example of it. I think what we took on was, uh, what did I tell her? We, we were Scientology light, Nexium Scientology light. It wasn't, we were forced into a lot of the behaviors that we were in. Like we had to take steps because they were being aggressive to us. And we just so happened that we had a lot of intel on our side that pointed to them being the criminals. They've had the same thing, but the justice system hasn't done the same thing for them for whatever reason. Now that I've been out in public and the, I think the highest compliment that I can get is when somebody says to me, you're, you're kind of like the Leah Remini of Nexium, And that, that means the world to me because I respect and admire her so much. So when I, we had the opportunity to talk to Leah, we were just so excited because she really is our, our cult busting hero. She kicks the door down. She kicks the door down. I'm so happy to share with you that Leah Remini is going to be our guest today. You know her from The King of Queens, but she's also been very outspoken about Scientology since she left in 2013. It's all over the front page news, CNN, everywhere. And most recently, her third season of Scientology in the Aftermath, which is on Netflix and AETV, I think I'm most excited about as her and Mike Reiner decided to also do a podcast called Scientology Fair Game, which is the up to date current situation, what's happening in Scientology, all the all the legal battles, all the attempts to um, expose the abuses there. And like I said, she's she's our hero. And not only that, but she's just so she's so cool. She has a complete trucker potty mouth as I do. So um, please be aware of the swearing that is about to occur, the F-bombs. Without further ado, Leah Remini. Welcome. Sinking down to the depths of the ocean. Hanging on to my love. I let go of it all I could leave. I Hi, Leah. Hi. Thank you so much for joining us today. I so enjoyed our last conversation. And like I said to you earlier, I wanted to keep going. So I, thanks for thanks for making that happen and joining us on our podcast. Absolutely. My pleasure. And hello to you, Nippy. I didn't get to talk to you last time. I know. I had some FOMO when that was going on. Yeah. <laughs> but she told me wait a week or two and here we are. So, And congratulations to you guys. Thank you. On your new podcast. Thank you very much. Thanks yes. for supporting. Uh, my pleasure. Absolute pleasure. There's so much to to talk about and um, we have a whole a whole list of questions, but okay. I thought we'd just sort of give you like the overall landscape because you know, you've obviously your your story is out there. You have a book, you have the podcast, you have Scientology in the aftermath season three, which is so amazing and fascinating and, and helpful and emotional. Oh my God. Watch that with a box of tissues. Same, same, same yeah. for you guys for the bow. Yeah. <laughs> totally. Um, and so we were thinking like, what would be different about this interview? And I think for us, you know, it's such a relief to find people who have gone through something similar, who get it. And our podcast, A Little Bit Culty, is we're looking at what's the what's the continuum between something that's like, it's a little, little culty, that's a bit weird, to like, that's a cult. And then also providing our our listeners with with tools to to make that distinction. Mm -hmm. And then also once they can recognize the, that distinction, get out and heal. And I think you're such a great trailblazer for all of those things. And so obviously this was a, a natural fit to have you on our on our show. That was that's sort of the overall thing. We have lots of like, you know, things, burning questions that we want to know and, and things to talk about. But Nippy's, because he wasn't in the last conversation on your podcast, I th thought that he could go first. Okay. I, I like Leah's style too. She's kind of kicks the door down and I kind of feel like we're teammates. We have a similar approach to that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> all attitude and all heart too. So I think that's what makes the package so compelling, yes. which is what I kind of like too. Or um, or annoying, depending on who's... It, well, you yeah. know what? The squeaky wheel gets the grease, right? <laughs> we hope, you we know? hope. Yeah. I mean, yes, you know, or, right. you know or you're the first person through the door always gets shot. Mm -hmm. I, I I was kind of willing to be that person. Yeah. That was my demographic. I was going to you know, hit the uh, alarm of outrage and deal with whatever came with it Yeah, because I felt like I was right. Yeah. But one of the things too, you know, to kind of come in on the heels of what she's saying is 
the whole cult thing and all that stuff kind of has people dismissing it. Right. And the abuses of power that go on in a cult are very similar to the abuses of power that go on in every single hierarchy that you could probably be a part of. And most hierarchies that we interface with are normally vulnerable to those abuses, whether it be politics or even just a one-on-one relationship. Right. You know, I can't tell you how many people have reached out to Sarah and I and said like, oh my God, I was in a relationship that was just like that. Sure. And I'll say this, you know, Nexium, ESP, whatever you want to call what we were doing was Scientology light yeah. in terms of how big it was and the extent of the abuses that were going on seemed to be more insular around Keith himself. And you guys had a whole I don't structure, know, structure right. Right. of it that mm-hmm. seemed to take on the personality of the leader. Now, I'm not sure if it was entirely LRH yeah. or if it was Miscavige or not at this point. When we had our thing go down, I felt once the cards are on the table, yeah, whoever's deciding, we had the winning hand, so to speak, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. And I was betting on that. I was betting that we had a system in place that wasn't going to allow branding of women on the crotch to exist. And sure. I was pretty confident that once this all came out, we had this in society that wasn't going to allow it to hit. Now, I happen to have been right. Yeah. And it happened very quickly. But in hindsight, I kind of recognize my confidence may have been a little bit naive. Yeah. Because I'm sure you felt the same way. Sure. I mean, it, ser- it served point. your purpose, right? Yeah. But, yeah. And I can't help in hindsight look back and go, what what is it in our culture that's allowing the abuses to exist in Scientology when you can literally Google an organization yeah. see on tape and footage the abuses that are going on and h- what does it mean about our culture that exists right. how does it exist what can we do about it as survivors i don't like to use the term survivors i like winners sarah and i are still debating that <laughs> i like that, it that I, moniker I like it. You, um, could, you could choose if you like it and how do you feel about that knowing what you know and you know for me i i have somewhat of i don't know if vindication's the right word but like okay yeah i did the right thing and then yeah we had a system in place that did due diligence in a very short amount of time. Yes. Um, you guys have been at this for a while. The abuses yep. have been going on for a while. They've been well documented for a while. Sure. Comment on that. How do you feel about that? Where well, do you see- so, so, so to, yeah, uh, all of that, the big, big question, big answer. Uh, you cut me off at any time, but from, from the work that I'm doing, right. So like, when people get out of a bad relationship, like you guys were mentioning, people say, I was in this, this is a relationship that I had. It wasn't a cult, but mm-hmm. it was cult-like or a little bit culty, right? Mm-hmm. Or uh, 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 an ideology that you grew up in, right? Could be a religion. It doesn't have to be a cult mm-hmm. uh, as per the definition of cult and, and, and the characteristics of what is a cult, but you could be culty and raised with an ideology that is cultish. Because that's just what you've been taught, right? That's your environment. And uh, over time, you just accept that as truth. And so when you get out of these things, you have to want to fix that shit mm-hmm. yeah. that got you in in the first place. Very often we do the first part, which is we got out. We become advocates for those who got out, right? Or want to get out. But I'm finding that not a whole lot of people are doing the actual work to find out how they got there. I'm like a child now, right? Where I'm like in this new life as old as I am now, but I feel like I'm learning for the first time who I really am, what I really believe. Because like I said, no matter what you're raised in, you don't know, do I really believe that? Do I really, is that a core belief of mine? Or was I just taught that? Or do I just think I believe that, right? Am I actually Mm -hmm. living the life that I claim to be? And so it's doing the work after that. What what Scientology does and, and cults like it, its teachings are of psychological warfare. Psychological warfare is the business of teaching the group that you're in, right? You're learning that there's the bad guys and we're the good guys. And so that leads to dehumanization. That mm-hmm. leads to bigotry. That leads to racism, right? This is all part of the psychological warfare, that these people, this group is wrong. We have the answers. Everything we do that's dirty, and awful is justified under this religious 
uh, whatever, whatever you know, ideology, theology, whatever you want to call it, you know, and, and that's how those things are justified. Um, that's how I justified them anyway. Yep. Right. Is that we're the elite of the world. And so anything that we do, but you, you mentioned something about, is that just David Miscavige? No, the, the teachings of Scientology is very methodical. It's, it's everything that you're forced to read. You have to read, you know, there's check sheets like school, you know, read pages five to 10. You have to clear every word you don't understand. You get checked out on the things you're reading and we're all reading the same things, right? Because Scientology mm-hmm. costs money. So you have to buy the course and then the course comes with a check sheet that you have to initial and if there's a star next to it, that, that means you have to get have it checked out by somebody. So you have to go into another room and they go, what's the definition of the, what's the definition of and, and there's no assimilating the information. It's what does it say exactly. And so all Scientologists learn the same thing. And that is to accept abuse and to be an abusive person. Was that explicit? What, what do you mean? Well, well like. When you said accept abuse and be abusive, was it explicitly yeah, of course. like? Well, if you the first book that is a mandatory read in Dianetics is Dianetics, uh, the modern science of mental health, in quotes, right? And it it uh, it promotes itself as a New York Times bestseller when, in actual fact, when Dianetics was put on the shelves, staff members were told to go and buy. You can't do this anymore. To go buy out the bookstores to, so then they would have to restock and then they were donating it to libraries or literally just dumping the books in the dumpster. Um, But, you know, also people were reading the book because it was an alternative. It was like, think for yourself. You can erase this part of your mind. That's destructive for the amount of the book. And, you know, so in the book, Nippy, it says in there that a seven-year-old and I'm paraphrasing now, but anybody can find this. I don't want anybody to take my word for it, that a seven-year-old should not shudder at being passionately kissed by an adult because that means that seven-year-old is not computing. So that means that seven-year-old boy or girl, is the word computing in Scientology means really not being rational because Mm. Scientology believes and teaches that that children are not actually children that they are old souls right. and little bodies, right? And then as you get to the next course, you progress to the next courses in Scientology, which again, are, are they have a, a price list, so nothing right. is free in Scientology. You do what's called the communications courses. And these courses are you know, relatively inexpensive because it's kind of like the entryway drug to Scientology, right? It's like the little, a little pot, a little this, a little that, right? So it's not... It doesn't start out thousands and thousands of dollars until you get into the confidential levels. Is it explicit? Yes. In, in that in these communications courses, which children at five can do, once they are able to sit there, they have to sit there and get baited by adults. And me, as a 12-year-old, had to do this course. And I had to sit there while grown men baited me to react. And the purpose of the drill is so that you get quote unquote flat on your buttons. And so you're not allowed to react. Now, if you cry or go, you're being disgusting or you're a fucking pig, you get what's called flunked. They say flunk. And then the person has to continue to say those things and do those things that cause a reaction in you. And so it says that you find the person's button and you push it hard. So I can I could tell you my experience, the experience of my sister, the experience of all of my female friends and male friends were was sexual. It was all, I, you know, I want to fuck you. Uh, you know, look oh. at your tits, look at your lips. I can imagine those around my dick. You know, the, oh, like, and I'm talking to you now. The way I'm talking to you now is really from my Scientology training. I mean, people are probably right now flinching and throwing up and, and, and disgusted at what I'm saying. They should be disgusted, but yeah. these are mandatory courses in Scientology. If something happens to you, Nippy, if you were young and Sarah, you were a young person in Scientology and your parent molested you or a Scientologist molested you, you would go into your Scientology counseling session and you would be rightfully so talking about the trauma that you experienced and Scientology teaches 
that you now to need to ask the person, have you ever done anything similar? Mm. Yeah. Mm. Protection. And then force you, Nippy, to go into a past life that and say that you've raped or molested a child in your life. And then they would basically the 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 concept is that you're responsible for what happens to you. I mean, it is it's very black and white. There is no like, well, okay. They might say that was fucked up, but you know, get over it. And you were how old when you went through that? Well, it starts at the the indoctrination of Scientology starts at the age of five, where you're treated as an adult. Wow. Um, I remember going into a church of Scientology for the first time in New York, and the staff there love bombed me and like, well done, Leah. You were born into a Scientology family again. You came back, and that's the motto of Scientology uh. in the Sea Org that we come back and. They treated me as an adult. And then when I joined the SEA organization, I was separated from my mother, living in a dorm, in a motel, and working from eight in the morning till midnight. No schooling, no nothing. And basically, if you have any issues, it's just, again, it's all you. If you say, I miss my parent, they'll they'll sit go, are you out of your fucking mind? Stop acting like a wog, which is a, a derogatory term and in some, some countries racist term, but it's basically and Scientology calls anybody who isn't a Scientologist a WOG. So they'll say that's WOG law. That's WOG medicine. That's WOG think. And missing your parents or being upset that you were molested or raped is WOG thinking. It's like mud blood in Harry Potter. Well, I don't know Harry Potter. Oh, okay. I'm so no, sorry. No, but my daughter would be it. horrified that I just said that. I won't hold it against you. because she's, she's big time. Um, and the other thing, Nippy, that I want to say is that Scientology becomes your uh, primary caretaker. Right. So as a Scientologist, even though I wasn't in the sewer, if my daughter, let's say, did drugs or was like not being a Scientologist, I would just send her to Scientology to get fixed. Like I wouldn't oh, really, wow. I don't parent my daughter. So Scientology parents don't parent their children. So that that abuser becomes your primary caretaker, and that's wow. where you, you know, learn life. So one of the things I look about the indoctrination, and I don't know yeah. what age it started for you, but I took I took my first training when I was like twenty six, twenty seven, and I remember going through the training, going, "Yeah, that works. That's bullshit. That's yeah. it doesn't seem like you had that option, and maybe because I I felt that because I already had my parents raising me, I had my own sense of my own morality." And it was somewhat impenetrable mm -hmm. by something at, at at the age that I was. But it seems the danger in that is that you're not you're having, like you said, the church determine your morality, and they're making you numb to certain things. That started at what age for you? Well, my mother got in when I was, uh, I think, nine or ten, and the communication courses started then. We weren't going into Scientology at this point, but because we lived in you know a different. Right. city we couldn't travel to where the Scientology was but when we got older she started forcing us to get on a train to go there but I, I remember my mother getting into Scientology I think I was about eight or nine. Do you remember a self before that before you started taking like how you thought and felt about things at an early age and then how that may have been compromised? Later well on? it just it it's I was young and I just remember like growing up like a typical child, but feeling disenfranchised because, you know, my, my dad was there, but I don't remember him being there. He was, you know, Catholic. My mother was Jewish, but my mother wasn't really raised in any religion because her parents died when she was very young. But uh, my grandmother was very Catholic. And I, I remember going to church with my grandma and, and feeling safe with her. Feelings, you know, she used to do the cross on my head at night, and she made me feel like a a child being protected. And I remember the difference between my grandmother, who treated me and my sister like children, and my mother, who was talking to me like I was an adult. Hmm. And I saw a change where my mother was like, you know, she gave us these little booklets, and it had like basic morals, like don't steal and don't. Di and I was like, well, that yeah, I mean, that's. Yeah. Um, but, you know, like, that's what I was doing. I was stealing. Right. You know what I mean? I was like, that's what we do here. Like, we steal leg warmers and we steal Smurfs. Like, that's what we do. We go to the <laughs> stationery store and we steal things. Like, 
But, you know, then she started telling me, like, I want you to tell me when you do bad things. And and I kind of like that because my friends mm-hmm. were rebelling against their parents and doing things. And I was like the good, bad girl. Like, I would stick up for people. But I wasn't really like the cutter of classes. You know what I mean? I really wouldn't, like, do that. Got it. But, you know, the smoking and the smoking pot, I was like, no, you know, I can't. If I smoke pot, my mother's going to be very mad at me. I did see a difference, Nippy, which was weird because my mother was like not hitting us. Mm -hmm. Whereas my other, my friend's parents were hitting them growing Mm -hmm. up. And my mother was becoming this more communicator, which wasn't usual for our neighborhood. (laughs) You, we For have sure. to be super careful when people and people do this with us too. Like, but you, but you got good out of it, and you know, and trying to find the silver linings, which for us is a really big fine line. I'm sure it is for you too. Like, of course. And we talked about this when when we did. I did your podcast. Like, I've had to go like, okay, what was good from it, so that yeah. I don't waste 12 years. But sure. I have to make sure that those good things were not from Keith. I have to Correct. find their original source. So. There was something good for you that your mom didn't hit you. That's not from Scientology. And that that's what I've been doing, too. And what's funny is, you know, even for the good parents who weren't raised in Scientology, you know, or or cults or coming from abuse themselves, you know, now I'm I'm reading parenting books now, you know, and I'm sending it to my mother. You know, my mother's like, what the fuck are you sending me? I'm too old. You know, you're right. You're grown. I don't need to be a better parent to you. And, you know, it's interesting because I'm like, I just never, I couldn't even imagine being this, like, I I never saw this parents, you know, in myself or in my mother. And I was like, this is the way you're supposed to parent? (laughs) I had no idea. What's what's that like for you now? Like, as a. It's hard. It's hard because, you know, I go, God, I hope I didn't fuck her up too bad. So far, you know, I hope I could, you know, reverse some of the damage. What does she think of what you're doing now? Like, does she, is she aware? Is she proud of you? How does, what's the the dynamic? Yeah, my, I think my daughter thinks that I'm, I'm tough. I think she's proud of me. I think when, when she, when I first left, she heard me on the phone and she was, you know, 10. She heard me screaming and crying on the phone with somebody and she came into the room and she said, mom, you've left, uh, she said psychology because she didn't know the word Scientology. She, and she, she goes, you left Scientology here. And she pointed and she had her finger on my forehead. And then she said, but you have to leave it here and then touch my heart. Wow. I know. I'm going to (laughs) cry. Wow. That's exactly what happened, Sarah. I started crying. Wow. And, uh, it's, she's right. But what we're talking about earlier, what I was talking about Scientology being your primary caretaker, you know, I left my parents, they raised me, Scientology raised me. It's always shocking to my, to my friends when I say I'm, I'm heartbroken over what they're doing. I'm heartbroken over what they're saying. I'm heartbroken by what they're doing to people who they know are telling the truth. And, and the response is usually, why are you shocked, Leah? Why would you be shocked? Why would you be heartbroken? And I'm like, cause it's, it's still somebody that I, that raised me. It's still hard to see when they know they're doing the wrong thing. It's still close to my heart. It's a weird, it's, it's, it's weird. It's still something that I, I struggle with. It's not, it's like a parent abusing you. You still love that parent, even though, you know, they're awful and doing bad things. (laughs) I totally feel, I I feel that. I feel that, that pain, like watching you in some of your interviews, like I cry deeply with you. And I, I don't know if you haven't been through something like this, if people get that, you know, in the same, in the same way, but I definitely feel like, oh, I don't know. I mean, I'm I'm curious. Do you ever run in, do you ever see any people, anyone accidentally? Do you ever bump into anybody and have like awkward moments? Yeah, they and, and I use this this analogy because I don't know. If, are, are you familiar with the pimp the pimp sort world? Of, yeah, you know, like if you <laughs> belong, <laughs> I'm I'm well versed. I'm well versed in the pimp world. But if you if you belong to another pimp and you know a pimp is driving by, you have to turn your back to that pimp to let them know like you, you're with right. somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> On a funny level, that's what happens. Like if I see them in like friends of mine that like were my former the former godparents to my daughter. Or I was the former godparent to their child. And friends of mine for 35 years literally turned their back to me. And it's it's heartbreaking. Like that that's the funny 
part, you know, that the pimp references yeah. just to be funny, but uh, it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking to see my goddaughter who lives in my neighborhood because I'm the one who suggested that she live in my neighborhood so that I could wow. take her when her mother had to work and to be in a certain school district. I wanted my goddaughter to be in, in a good school district and uh, to see her, you know, growing up and I can't run to her. You know, when I'm getting coffee in the morning at my local coffee shop or I'm driving by and I see them walking, you know, going on a hike, I, like it kills me. It's it's they literally feel they can't talk to me. I consider my friends family mm-hmm. people who know me know that like I don't you're loyal. You know, I have these big ideas, movie ideas, you know, movie moments that they would leave Scientology and I would be vindicated, mm-hmm. you know, and, you know, in my in the movie, I'm like, yeah. So how does it feel now? You know, but I know that that's not me. I know I would crumble and accept them and do anything for them if they left. You know, I wish I was the person who said, no, fuck you, bitch. (laughs) No, no." you'd welcome them back with open arms. Yeah, Yeah, man. Yeah. 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 You know. (laughs) I feel the same way of every single person that's still in. It's just not in my nature to to turn you away. And, And again, somebody that I considered family. You know, these are people that I considered family. So, you know, it's hard, you know, I look through all my pictures a lot because I'm, I'm in constant need to, to organize pictures for my daughter who could give a shit, but, um, I but told I you everything. we're the same person. Sarah, yeah. Like no. I showed her the other day. I have every dress. I have every dress of this kid's, you know, first five birthdays in like, you know, NASA, like fucking <laughs> sealed dresses from every birthday. I have every, uh, you know, I print photos out and I label you know, first birthday, second birthday, third birthday, you know, first time you ate, first time you said something cute, first, like everything's organized. So I'm looking through all these photos and I'm like, all of my memories are wrapped up in Scientology. That's hard. And Scientologists. It is really hard. Yeah. Well, you got married when yeah. you guys were in, right? You got, you had your babies when you, it's just so many memories are wrapped up in such mm-hmm. an awful time of yeah. your life. Is there, there, is there anything that you, that you would look back on and like miss elements? Is it just friendship? Is there anything else that feels like you wish you could just extract that or? No, it's, it's, you know, we felt that we were part of something bigger than ourselves, right? We thought we were. Not just actors anymore. Look at us. We're saving mankind. We have purpose. We have a mission. The sense of community. Now we have to not look at this time and and our energies as wasted, but finding the purpose in the pain. We tell our stories. We change the world. A Little Bit Culty is proud to support the hashtag I Got Out Project, which empowers survivors of cultic abuse to share their stories online as a catalyst for education, prevention, and healing. Learn more about the hashtag I Got Out movement and find resources at igotout.org. Not everybody feels an urgency to make this planet a better place. Not everybody feels that. I think that people involved in in these types of uh, organizations really, we really believed that not only were we making our lives better, but we were making the lives better of others, right? Which would in turn, you know, have that effect, right? That we were doing something that was important and it wasn't just about us. And, you know, to find that again in community, it's not that easy. Yeah, you know, what it, what I feel like I've learned is you don't get to pick and choose what and how you're going to stand for what you're going to stand for. And oftentimes that's thrust upon you. I'd say you've passed that with flying colors. I I yeah. I feel like I've done my best to stand yeah. for what I want to stand for and how I want to do it. And then, you know, one of the things I I notice about you is that if you are able to do that and expand your capacity to do that in whatever domain you want to thrive in, that ultimately creates your immediate community. And unless you are going to be someone who's going to try to lead something, and 
one of the things I've also learned is the impulse to save the world is normally a uh, disguise for an impulse to rule it. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. For cult leaders. For cult leaders, right? If you expand your own domain and, and stand for what you can, the best you can. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. What are your self-care non-negotiables? Maybe you never skip leg day or never miss yoga. Maybe it's getting eight hours of sleep. I mean, that's my personal and everyone's dream, isn't it? Well, I definitely have some non-negotiables. Like I'm in Vancouver right now and I'm spending literally as much time as I can outside in nature. Hashtag cold pools, hashtag crushing it. Nature is a non-negotiable. Not enough time in the fresh air and the trees around me and I start to feel not great, not myself, not grounded. Therapy day is a bit like my nature walks. I try to not miss it. And I know I'm just going to feel so much better all around if I make it a priority. I get so much out of it. It helps me put my worries and anxieties in their rightful place and helps me clear my mind so I can focus on what I really need and sometimes what I don't need. Like, I don't need to be overbooking myself just because I hate to say no to people. You know what I mean? Thanks, therapy. Thanks for helping me see that. And if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire and get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Look, even when we know what makes us happy, it's hard to make time for it. But when you feel like you have no time for yourself, non-negotiables like therapy are more important than ever. Never skip therapy day with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash culty today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash culty. Meals bring people together. But for many families, providing their next meal can be a challenge. You can help by participating in Macy's annual Feeding the Hungry Food Drive. All proceeds go toward local food banks and families. Now through January 31st, you can purchase an icon in-store or online, or watch out for the blue Feeding the Hungry shelf tags, where a portion of your purchase will be donated to local pantries. Together, we can combat hunger in our local communities at Macy's. The Frankies were a picture-perfect influencer family, but everything wasn't as it seemed. I just had a 12-year-old boy show up here asking for help. He's emaciated. He's got tape around his legs. Ruby Frankie is his mom's name. Infamous is covering Ruby Frankie, the world of Mormonism, and a secret therapy group that ruined lives. Listen to Infamous wherever you get your podcasts. You know, your family and your friends become your community. Sure. As opposed to searching for one to join. Yeah. And that's something I didn't know at 20, whatever. I kind of felt like I had to join and, you know, it wasn't really a joiner, but it, I, you know, when I explored it, it felt okay um, until it didn't. Of course. And you guys did, you know, you guys got to an end, right? You took this person who was hurting people out of the equation and he is where he needs to be. You know, Mike and I have yet yep. to achieve that as well. People before us, you know, we're a small group with with a, with an organization that has tax exemption and protection um we 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 still have this goal to achieve it's still hurting people children are still being raised in this abusive toxic environment still learning that they're not allowed to go to the police if they're being molested or raped they're learning this every day and so there's a sense of urgency for us of like we yeah. have to stop this from happening to people and then on top of that all the things that I thought I was achieving in Scientology, right? There's like a list and then coming out of it and seeing Mm -hmm. the real world. I'm like, wait, oh my God, I'm so behind. I I have so much work to do. I have so many things. Wait a minute. I need a degree for that. Wait a minute. I got to get through this red tape to to fix that. And so there's that kind of like frantic energy that goes with, I, you know, I want to do the work that I, not just with Scientology. There's kind of this franticness, right? Because I felt like I was just kind of like born, just starting life, thinking for myself for the first time, you know? And now you get to do it without shackles. Yes and no. I mean, I, ha- I it takes work to then heal yourself. Like we were talking earlier, right? right? You got to heal that shit. Because although I was indoctrinated as a child, as an adult, like you're saying, Nippy, I'm, I'm sitting there going, this is fucking crazy. This is bullshit. You get reprimanded for that. You have to go back and reread or redo something at your expense if you disagree. So you learn to stop disagreeing. You're not allowed to have an opinion. Yes, I did have those thoughts as well. Like, this is nuts what we're doing. This is not okay what we're doing. But it, it, in those moments, it was where you are you ready to leave everything you've ever known and your whole family to disown you? <laughs> and so oftentimes you're, you stay in reluctantly. 
Right. Well, those seems to be the obstacles because even if you are in this and you recognize the abuse, you have the obstacles of number one, your own mind, your indoctrination, potentially losing things, your support network, and then an organization that's litigious and has right. the support of the United States government, not just not just protected by it, it's it's supporting the abuse. So that's a those are some pretty daunting things that you take on and, and that you, you're still taking on and you want to make yourself effective in taking down this monster. So that's yeah. you got a big yeah. you got a big you know, pile of stuff on your plate. Yeah. We all do. And, and we want to help. I mean, that, like, that's the thing. Here's the thing. We all do. If that exists in our culture, we all have that. The abuses work for someone. They can work against you in, in some capacity. And the fact that there's so many people that are willing to support this, particularly people in our entertainment industry, we don't have to name names, but you know that that's a serious, serious thing. And I don't think people well, they all say- feel that enough. I think that's, you know, and I think one of the things that you bring right to yeah. people's yeah. conscious is that this is serious shit. This is in your living room. This is like, if you think this is just going on here, this is an indoctrination that we're all going through. And if it doesn't get taken down, it gets stronger. And if it has the support of our United States government through the First Amendment, that's a scary thing. It's a scary thing to abuse. And I, and listen, if people listen to our podcast and walk away from this alarmed and outraged at that, I think we're doing our jobs. Agreed. Agreed. And, you know, we, we need more people who are speaking up and, and contacting their their congressmen and women, their city, you know, a, a, anything and everything, contacting the IRS saying, you know, look into what Scientology is operating as, because it, even if you take something as simple, and I, and I think you guys have heard this before, you've heard, I, I've, I've said it when I was a Scientologist, oh, you could be a Christian Scientologist, you could be a Catholic, sci-, you know, well, that's just a line that we were yeah. taught to say to promote Scientology and to get more members, but you can't be a Christian Scientologist and have tax exemption. Like you can't be an organization that, that that believes in different things. As a matter of fact, it's probably the only time Scientology was honest when when they were being considered for tax exemption. They have to they have to believe in one thing that is that has no other beliefs. Like the Catholic Church believes in what the Catholic Church believes in. They don't believe in mm-hmm other things they say this is what we believe in christian this is what we believe in right like scientology had to say we only believe in scientology forsaking other beliefs to be considered to be its own religion so that's how they got tax exemption on top of fair gaming uh, you know what fair game is nippy yeah 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 the ira individual uh criminal investigation uh, agents of the irs they were having them followed, they were going through their garbage, they were harassing them, and uh, that's how they actually gained tax exemption. So, yeah, I mean, unless people are making a stink about this and understand that your tax dollars are subsidizing these activities of Scientology, of spending millions of dollars hiring private investigators to stalk and harass victims of Scientology, I mean, we're talking hundreds of millions of dollars of tax exempt money that that are, is being used wrongly this is not why they have tax yeah. exemption the reason why they have tax exemption is because they're supposed to be benefiting the public right in some way they're supposed to be putting it into yeah putting it into things to helping people but they're not right? and so yeah. there is no over there is no committee there is nothing that 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 is watching what they're doing and so you know, you know more people that understand what is really going on there it's just not a bunch of people you know, we don't do this just because we we don't have anything better to do. We do it because it's the right thing to do, and it's not just us. It's but it's a small group, as you well know, as you you're well aware. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> most people just don't have the the drive to fight, or they don't have the value. But also, like you, Leah, are putting yourself out there in so many ways. And I my my question was more about the emotional side. What is it like to fight that so publicly, but also? I mean, you're still healing. Like how, what is it like to be, is it to feel vulnerable? Do you feel, does it, is it fortify you to have public support? How does, what is it like? Yeah, it's, you know, every day is different. You know, there's days that I feel great. And, and, and this, like I said, the small group of us that are doing this, you know, feel, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we get little wins here and there. And then, you know, a, a judge rules for Scientology and you feel like giving up and you feel like, you know, is, are we ever going to get anywhere? Uh, you know, is the universe ever going to 
help us out. Is God ever going to help us out? <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, when is it our turn? When is it the victim's turn to, yeah. to get, uh, support? Uh, and you know, it's up and downs. Yeah. It's, it's not easy to do, uh, but I'm going to continue to do it. it. You know, I'm going to fight through my days of not wanting to do it and wanting to be on a, a, but you know, then I take jobs that are just fun because I just love, you know, I remember why, why I do what I do. I like to make people mm-hmm. laugh and, you know, I get reminded that like, oh, that's why I do it. You know, that. Yeah. Right. And then, you know, Mike and I get messages all the time, you know, like you said, mm-hmm. it's not just about the cults that we were in. It's you gave me the strength to get another job. You gave me the strength to move. You guys gave me the strength to leave an abusive relationship. You guys gave me the strength to, you know, start thinking differently, you know, and, the, and you know, that's what keeps us going. Right. And I'll just reiterate this from your interview with me that you guys gave us the strength to speak out against Keith and Nexium. I I mean, you say that and I I like, (laughs) that's so amazingly gracious and, and, and it's true. um, I it's Thank true. you for, for, for that. I mean, absolutely. I, no, it, yeah. I look up to you so much. I truly like, I, I saw it. I saw the shows. I saw you in public. She can do it. I can do it. Thank you. So Yeah. And, uh, and also, you. you know, you don't want to succumb to the shame. Yeah. And that was one of the things that I just said, I'm not going to stay here. And I saw how you guys handled it, particularly Mike too. I wanted to tell Mike that um, hopefully I'll have that opportunity. Yeah. Just the, the 180 that he pulled and took his life force and put it towards doing the right thing is is inspiring to everyone. I don't know how it can't how it can't not be. Thank you guys. I mean, it means a lot to us, and we, like I said, to you guys and to all of you. You know, we sat and watched you, and we were texting each other, going, "Wow, look at these fucking powerful motherfuckers! Like they're just st- like, wow, fucking, <laughs> oh my god, so jealous! Oh my god, look at these! I mean, look <laughs> at them go!" And it, it, we were so proud of you guys and it wasn't even something we ever were involved in but just to see you guys fight the way you fought and and knowing how hard it was for you guys just as individuals but also as a couple you know to to stay to stick it out together you know it's really really difficult and uh you guys did it you guys did it and so proud sitting there and uh, still so proud of you too, that you continue the work. You know, it's one thing to do a, it's great. People do documentaries, they do a news story and that's great, but it does take a different type of person to continue the work. Yeah, I agree. I was no to a lot of this stuff. It's difficult to ascertain what to embrace and what not to, especially when people kind of just want your story. They like the salacious aspect. Oh, yeah, you don't right. really know who who to trust when all that stuff and you don't want to be a punchline and that sort of thing but in this age where you have podcasts and you have long form where people can hear your side hear the nuance and stuff like that unfortunately you know there's avenues to do that and we can have people such as yourself i don't know if 20 years ago we would even be talking if something like this happened it just wouldn't be the lines right. of communication in the way that we could get each other to to draw the parallels and connect the dots and, and get this wisdom out there in a way that you can today, which is the upside of, you know, what's going on right now. And I, and I look at, you know, the Twitter where I think Twitter is yeah. McDonald's for the mind. You know, I, I got on that thing in August and got off yeah. in, the, in the next month because I just thought it was just, it's poison. But some of it, if you can, harness it. if you can mm-hmm. put good energy into the internet and put goodwill into it, that's where I think it serves its point and you can have merits where like your thumbprint on, mm-hmm. on whatever that is that ether world and you know where your avatar hangs out and people take a shot at it or, yeah. or whatever um if you can just put good things on it and and hang your hat on that yeah. this is that yes. you know and if hearing you and mike i just thought wow just that people need to understand that and you know, i think the conversations will distill it and refine it where people can go huh i've seen that I've yeah. seen that. Yeah. And, you know, and I hope that people also, like you're saying, like find, find the meeting beyond yeah. our cult, right? It's, it's here. You guys were small group 
who just said, we need to do something about this. You could have just walked away. You didn't. And I think people feel, well, what, what can I do? I'm just me. I'm just one person here. I don't have a degree or I do have, it doesn't matter. You know, you do have the power. You do have a lot more power than you think to change something that you're passionate about. And you do have the power just by knowing what your why is, right? Like people talk about your why's, like what's your why yeah. And you need to know what your mm-hmm. why is. Our our why has always been to help. I mean, unfortunately, unfortunately, as, as geeky as that mm-hmm. shit sounds, that's why we were all involved in this shit. It wasn't like it cost a lot of money for us, it, you know, for Mike, who was in the Sea Org all of his life. It was all day, all night, 365, being abused physically, mentally, giving up his children, giving up any outside influences, you know, for Sea Org members, they give up their lives, literally. They're like morning, noon, and night is about forwarding the message of Scientology and running Scientology organizations to parishioners. And what, what Mike and, and other executives where Mike was experienced is horrible. But the fact that Mike left, the fact that high like the 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 top tier of Scientology left and were speaking out at the risk of what they were going to be receiving and Mike is still receiving mm-hmm. you know says a lot about who he was inside the whole time yeah mm-hmm. Scientology didn't make Mike render a person who was willing to do the work right that that thing that was inside of you nippy going yes. what in the fuck back then was always there. That's what got you out. Yeah. That's what makes you, that 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 guy who wanted to help people is still there. And that's what we are now. Like we're still people who want to help. Yeah, the, Scientology didn't build your character. Your character was there and it's actually your character that's taking it down. Same, same to you guys, to all of you. Yeah, right. Like, <laughs> and so you have my uh, <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. You have to have some of that, right? Yeah. You have to have that. I still want to kick a little ass. I still have that impulse. I didn't really get to no shit. I didn't get to kick a little ass. It's one of the things that's still kinda when I get in, when I get in my workouts, I'm like, I didn't get to I didn't get to protect my family and but Yeah, yeah. They did. They got us yeah. out. I know, I know. Of Intellectually course. I get it, but I part mean, of me's like, I want to finish them off. <laughs> I understand yeah. that. And, and my husband would feel the same way. And, you know, we were talking about that the other day. It's yeah. like, you know, you know, Twitter, like you were talking about Twitter and Instagram and, and social media, you know, you can't, you can't crack somebody in the mouth, you know, who, who talks that kind of shit from afar. You know what I mean? So it, it, yeah. if you were in a neighborhood doing that, that'd be a little, you know, things would be different. Um, you can just spew that, spew that yeah. vitriol. Uh, but I get that as as uh, a protector. I I get that feeling. Yeah. And, um, you yeah. but you did kick his ass in, in a bigger way, in 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 a much more <laughs> yes. And I guess I'll take this moment to you know thank the FBI and the people that that stepped up to take care of it. No, you guys were lucky. They haven't done shit for us. But and I I I'm, I really do feel like it's at a tipping point. I don't know, like if I'm just naive or whatever, but I really feel like things are about to shift for your fight. I don't know why I think that, but I do. So I just. From your mouth to God's ears. (laughs) I I, I mean, honestly, I hope that that's true. I really do. I hope so too. But you know, we have to believe. That's the thing too. When you get out of a cult, there's a lot of people, myself included, who it's since you like, you know, made a mistake or bet on the wrong horse, as Nippy and I say, it's hard to trust again. And like, you know, a lot of these groups, if you don't have somebody that you trust taking you there to help heal. Like a lot of people just don't even make the leap to even pick up the book because they can't, I mean, I couldn't read for a while because I was so anxious and so distraught. So like, I don't know, maybe having somebody hand you something that's like, here's what you need now. I don't know. There used to be the cult awareness network that was bought out by Scientology. As a matter of fact, oh that's, who's, that's who's running. Jesus. That's who's running. Ken is our Scientologist. That's so ironic. <laughs> So, and, and, you know, I'm sure you guys get this too. A lot of people reach out to me and Mike and, and you guys too about, hey, my son or daughter is in a cult or in a cult-like relationship. What do I do? And, you know, oftentimes I, I'm like, where? what do they do? Because if you're not well-versed in the cult the person's talking about, 
you're sending them down the wrong road. Yeah. Mike yeah. and I have had that where people have given us advice. I was like, that doesn't work for Scientologists. Like whatever. Mm-hmm. That's great. That's great for something else, but that doesn't work. Yeah. There's a distinction between cult experts and Scientology experts or Nexium experts. Exactly. There's more nuance. And, that, and the fact yeah, that you sure. have to spend your time explaining what your cult is, is also, you know, that should cost money. It's not for free, Yeah, yeah. you know, and you yeah. have to often explain it. And, you know, we we need people who are well versed in in different types of cults and and uh, extreme religions, so that that they know exactly like like you were saying in the in the beginning, Sarah. Like you know, you got to find where where did that come from? We have to dispel mm-hmm. the fact mm-hmm. that that came from your cult leader. You know that, that mm-hmm. they didn't come up with that. And once you find out, like that came from there, that came from you know, and we need to get out of the one source kind of frame of mind and understand that life is about knowledge is sure knowledge is right like so you take that from there you take that from there that shit doesn't work for me i don't know what the fuck that is no you know (laughs) and you 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 take what makes sense to your core beliefs and it's i and i agree with nippy it's like you have to know who you are really right like you have i know a lot about myself in the last six years it's not all pretty and so i got to deal with that part Mm -hmm. i actually had a question about that i've I've heard you in a couple interviews mentioned that you recognized that because you were raised in this abusive environment that you didn't know how to communicate or you that you recognized that there were some elements that you wanted to evolve and i i had a similar experience where somebody after i left who i thought was a friend and we left together but basically was sharing quite publicly that i was abusive (laughs) And I at first was super offended and like, I don't see myself that way. And, you know, after I've just like found them lawyers and like gotten them out and I'm like, what? And I was like upset by this. And then I talked to my, you know, my cult, Dan Shaw, who was one of my first cult recovery therapists, specialized in narcissists. And he just said to me, look, when the leader is a narcissist and abusive, the whole system is abusive. So I also was trained and well, I think our abuse was other than the branding, of course, but in, in terms of the day-to-day at ESP, our abuse was more tacit. Sure. It wasn't as overt yes. as, as Scientology, but I, I had to own that, you know, I gaslit people and I, you know, I, I, I it's so hard for me to say that I, you know, that I, I, I wasn't my best self. Yeah. I was, I was mean. I was a bitch. Sure. I was uh, right, righteous. Yes. Um, you know, all of these things that I, and I'm just like, are, are you easy on yourself on that? Or are you hard on yourself for that? Like, cause I, I, re- I resonate with, with your journey in that dis- discovery. Well, there's, like, there's only so many times I can apologize, right? Like, you know, then I started seeing that the people that I was apologizing to were gaslighting, abusive, misogynistic assholes themselves. So I was like, what the fuck am I doing? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I was, cause we come from a different world of like, Hey, fucking own that shit. And and yeah. eat crow and go over there with your tail between your legs. Just right. own your shit, you know. Own your right. shit, bully, right? Which is yeah. abusive in itself, right? To teach people right. to do that because you cannot then go to your, you know, you're going to then your abuser and saying sorry that you had to abuse me. I'm sorry that I was that I was there physically. So it's it's a very <laughs> toxic, toxic. It's so toxic. yeah. So. Um, Yes, I had to own my stuff, but I'm learning now that not everybody is uh, better than me. Not not everybody is acting uh, in my best interest or even in their own, right? But I put myself below them because, well, I was abusive and I should, you know, I'm not, I'm not excusing my behavior, but that's what I was taught by my primary caretakers, right? That, that this was an abusive cult. And so I was doing that. So now I have to take responsibility and ownership of that, but also realize that who I'm talking to is also an abusive mm-hmm. person or not somebody that I could be, that could be gracious and responsible with my growth. And I just have to kind of accept the fact that, that I was, that I am, and that I'm working on that and I'm working on mm-hmm. changing yeah. that and I have to forgive myself and not be too Yeah, hard I didn't know what I didn't yourself. know, yeah. right? Yeah. Like I, I didn't right. know that. So now I know that. So right. now I now I'm trying to be uh I'm trying to learn and I'm trying to evolve and uh trying to be a better version, but that's that's all I could do at this point. But I have stopped feeling the need to write emails and I have stopped 
Oh, good. I have stopped mm-hmm. like apologizing um, to people who are like, you know, not not there. Yeah. Well, you know, also people will take advantage of that. Yeah. Right. Like as soon as you know, yeah. you can also I, I feel like what we've done and and again with you as the trailblazer, this everything you do is the apology like that. Your show is you're fixing things. Yeah. You are fixing things actively. You're putting your life force into your, you know, your book, your podcast, the series that is you making it right. And if people want to give you a hard time, tell them to go fuck themselves. That's what I say. Well, the thing is, is that that, that nobody really is giving me a hard time, right? Like you're saying, Sarah, it's really people uh, of Scientology attacking us, right? And yes, in life, we're going to, you know, yes, there, there have been times in business where on our show, we're you know, people have said things to us, and I'm sure they said that to you guys. Oh, do you, is that because you were in Scientology? Like, if we yelled at somebody or got upset at somebody, it's like, no, we're yelling at you because you fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> My other thing is the um, the one of the things we're doing every episode, Nippy and I, is something called "That Chaps My Ass." I like it, and we're talking about something just benign and stupid that happened that people don't know about because it's not headline worthy. That's just all right. Give me some examples. Yeah, I'm going to give you an example. So like we weren't allowed to drink and and we're supposed to not be dependent on anything on the outside to be happy. But but Nancy had to drink coffee before going up on stage or like up in front of the room like she was. And that like there were certain inconsistencies. So that was like an example or mine for today was that when we left, when we left Nexium, we still had like spies on the inside who were kind of playing both sides. And we were told that Nancy was telling people like sh- shit talking us, yeah. like me, her, her former favorite, like her bonus daughter, yeah. by the way, was, well, Sarah was unhappy for a long time. In fact, she kind of st- stopped being involved when she had a baby and got married to Nippy and her deficiency was covered. So she wasn't really involved in ESP anymore. Now she's just looking for an excuse to leave. So my deficiency was covered by having a baby. Sure. So hearing that shit talk yeah. chaps my fucking oh, ass. Oh, yeah. So anyway, so how about, do you have one like that? Just put you that's a Scientology spot. one. That's not. Uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> well, I guess <laughs> the thing that that really chops my ass is that they actually have fucking. <laughs> did I say it right? Okay. Yes, yes. Yeah. The same inflection. Okay. Too good. Is, is that they have actual um, front groups on social media, and they have websites to protect the religious uh, beliefs of others, uh, and and they are protectors of the First Amendment and and free speech and freedom of religion, and yet. They try to silence us at every turn. Like the organization is literally there. They're all, they're only on social media to silence us. Wow. That chops Motherfuckers. my fucking ass. <laughs> Thank you for playing along. My pleasure. <laughs> I thought you wanted to give me, I thought we should play that chaps my ass, but for something completely unrelated. Well, so, let's do that too. Okay, I'll you, give you one. What should we I'll do? This, no rules okay, here. Okay, this yeah. really yeah, annoys no me. And I want to, I want to <laughs> pitch this as part of your show. Okay. <laughs> they have to p- pick a cult that traps my ass and then just life that traps my ass. Okay. 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 When yeah. you're on the freeway, highway, wherever, oh, here you we do go. not put on your fucking wipers on the freeway. Do you? Wait, what do you t- like when it's raining? No. When you're cleaning oh. your windshield. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. On no, the no, fucking no, freeway. No. I can get on board And then with you that. wet everybody behind you with your fucking liquid. With your cleaning and ruin and ruin your nice clean. Who car. does this? Assholes. Chaps my ass. I'm with you. Do you have one? Do you have a chaps my ass unrelated to cults? Well, I'm on the spot I have a few here. about you, but we'll save that for. Do I have a chaps my ass <laughs> unrelated to cults? You don't like waiting. Um, I don't, I don't like, like waiting. waiting. I hate waiting. Oh, I can't. Jesus I can't. Christ! Do I hate, I hate. waiting? But that's I mean, like- look. I mean, this was this started with my mom. Love her to death, but like I can remember being in college. And walking into the TV room in the kitchen and she's struggling with the television and she's like, can you change the station? I can't seem to get this to work. And she's been trying for like five, 10 minutes to change the fucking television with a calculator. <laughs> and I'm just going, well, you know, no, can you do, that's you know, cute. No. no, no, I swear to God. No, that's Wait, funny. No, that can't, that's not I can't chat your ass. ass. That's no, not that a no, 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 hold on, hold on. That didn't chat my ass. I'm just saying that's what I was waiting on. I mean, we would wait for her and I'd say 
Sarah and I's relationship, aside from us, me waiting for her to get out the door, yeah. it's like, can I add five more things before we get out the yes. door? Yes. That's what I like to do. I and like then, to I, no, and then I'm going, dude, I don't know. Can I do this for the rest of my life? <laughs> can I, can I fucking do this for the rest of my life? Every time I got to leave. And I'm seriously having that thought. I'm like, just chill. You're just waiting at the door. You're waiting for the elevator. Press the elevator button. Like it's that's so, funny. It's good so, that I think we're that going to couples counseling right after this. Yeah. No, it's we, good. We're no, roll no. that right in. No, we we well, won't get out the door. Well, this is what it, what my husband does now. He puts the TV on, and he watches Sports Center or whatever the fuck other sports anything sports related. But when he's you know quote unquote waiting for me, I'm like, you're not waiting for me. If I'm making sure the fucking doggy door is on, if I made sure this candle was blown out, if I made sure you closed your bathroom window and locked it, like you're not waiting on me. I'm doing a hundred things while you put on a fucking pair of pants and and went downstairs. Can I chime in? Yeah, exactly. No, No, we're on the same page. Just so you know, my ass is is starting to (laughs) chop It's chapping. (laughs) Because that's the narrative you guys use. Nipping. But but if you did those things... While I was doing what, my what have you stuff. been doing? Well, this is what I why this is what I found why out. Why is it so urgent Sarah, before we leave? It's not urgent. It's just that we assumed you had done it. Oof, good yes, God. and then we walk around and realize all I'm the lights are, are still on. I'm outnumbered. Right, where uh, the lights are still on. I'm like, well, if you if you want to be more efficient, but Nippy, I will. But but uh, in your defense, I will say actually, it is annoying that we feel the need. Like it is a little bit of an obsession to have to make it's a little OCD. Yeah, it is. Right? It okay. is in your yeah. defense. Yeah. Fair yes, enough. I, Let's yes. just, I'll, I'll meet you okay. there. I'll meet okay. you there. I'm glad we met. Well, you guys, listen, I want to thank you for having me. And again, we admire the shit out of the both of you and, and all of you. Feelings mutual. Thank you. And anything you need from us, we're here for you always. You need I any any way. counseling, you, you know, couples counseling, <laughs> Nippy, you call me, Look, call Angelo. We're here for you. It's going to be on the DL. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So much guys. love. Have a okay. great weekend. Thank Congratulations Thank again. Okay. Thank you. Thank very you. Much. You too. All right. Okay. I just want to say, does anyone else start dancing when they hear that song? Because I do. Every time it goes into the I never been. I think we've established I don't dance. Okay, Nippy all right. <laughs> Nippy doesn't yeah. dance. Partly the excitement of talking to Leah and that song. I, I almost every time listening to our own podcast, I have a dance party in our living room, which we may or may not film and put on Instagram, depending on demand. Just leaving it there. Nippy's looking at me like, what? Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. What yeah. are you offering? But listen, in all seriousness, wasn't that wasn't that great? She's a force. And I want to be her friend. Like, I feel like I think you've got, I think you've earned that with her. Well, I think maybe. she likes we'll, you. Uh, we'll, wants to be I hope friend. so. But yeah. In regards to what you asked me earlier, who do I miss? And I was sharing that I feel like it's the community and the vibes. It's the support. The Nexium community was built in support, which is something that's really important to me and something that I thrive in. And, you know, when I met Leah and, you know, hear her story and and we were bantering back and forth and I relate so much, I feel like I have an ally. And I think that's why I, I was so excited to talk to her twice now. Yeah, I think she feels the same way. I mean, I, hope I think so. it's mutual. Yeah, we're so lucky to have to to have that. Yeah, we're lucky to have someone come out and support us in the way they did and support what we're doing. And like you said, we have an ally. She's yeah. great. And all of the things that she's involved in, I think, are interesting. Um, incredibly helpful if you're in a similar situation like us, leaving a high control group. Um, but I think all of the media that she's produced and is a part of is fascinating regardless, especially Scientology and the aftermath, which is on Netflix and AETV.com in the U S and here in Canada is on Apple TV. And then now their latest project, their podcast, which is super important because it's a little bit more up to date with what's happening now, real time in terms of Scientology. Uh, It's called Scientology fair game. And, uh, well, it's her and Mike Rinda um, cont- continuing the fight. Yeah, because their fight's not over. Yeah, and they also talk a lot about in their podcast what what you can do if you want to, you know, bring it to the attention of your of your local government. Department. Well, it's remember we were talking the other night about how the reason stuff like this still exists is because there's a 
tacit support group of it. Right. Right. You That's know, so, go. and, and well, I mean, this is what's going on with cancel culture and stuff like that. They're trying to get it right. You know, going out and canceling people might not be the appropriate uh, response to it, but there is an awareness that comes about knowing that there's people that are supporting people who are aligned with abusers. And that's ultimately what Leah does a really good job of articulating, turning her story into wisdom so we all know what it looks like so we can hold it accountable. Uh, that's been our journey. And I think that's what Leah and Mike do really, really well. And it's, I'm honored to be aligned with them and, and have their support. Absolutely. So we've been lucky in that. And actually, Mike is going to be our guest for next week's episode. And his story is wild. So it's Mike Rinda. Mike Rinda. Stay tuned for that episode. Thank you guys for listening. I hope you found that as enjoyable as we did. Bye for now. Bye for now. We're going to be back soon with more episodes of A Little Bit Culty with more experts and survivors and sometimes experts who are survivors and some familiar faces from The Vow. If you got suggestions or questions on upcoming topics, find us on Instagram at A Little Bit Culty. And for more background on what got me to this point, my memoir, Scarred, the true story of how I escaped Nexium, the cult that bound my life, is available on Amazon, Audible, and wherever books are sold. If you'd like to help us spread the word about a little bit culty podcast, please give us a five star review and tell your friends to subscribe. Like literally take their phone out and, and press subscribe. Five stars. Five That's stars. five of them. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and every major listening app. A little bit culty is executive produced by me, your co host, Sarah Edmondson, and Anthony Nippy Ames. Associate producer is Jess Tardy. Produced, edited, mixed, and mastered by Citizens of Sound. Our amazing theme song, Cultivated, is by John Bryant and co-written by Nigel Asselin. Additional original music is composed by Will Rutherford. We'll be back with more episodes. Until then, don't, don't join, join a, a cult. cult. I'm Sarah Edmondson, and thanks for listening to A Little Bit Culty.